everybody. This is Brenda Hickey. Hello, everybody. And you're here at Brenda's panel, where she'll both do a presentation and afterwards be open for your questions. As you've heard in the opening ceremony, I hope you're all there, Brenda is an artist for the IDW Pony Comics and has worked on several of the issues of the series. So if you have any questions about art, comic making, or whatever else you're curious about, Brenda, then feel free to ask. Um, we'll have a Q&A part in the second part of the panel. So first, Brenda will do a general presentation she, that she prepared with some lovely illustrations <laughs> about her work, the process of making art. So, but after that, if you still have questions, you feel free to queue up at these both helpful microphones. It, just make sure you keep it family friendly, please, and don't ask for any spoilers or anything that Brenda is not even allowed to talk about, even if she knows about it. So keep it nice, keep it friendly, and show that you love what she does, because that's what she's here for, sharing some love. So. Another thing I need to say, because, you know, regulations and stuff, please do not bring food into this room at all. I get it, you're hungry, you know, you have some munchies, but no, no, please keep the munchies outside. You're allowed to bring water in here because it's really warm today, but no other drinks either, nothing that can stick or make a mess. So please keep all your other drinks and food inside your bags or outside the room, please. Thank you very much. So without further ado, it's time for Brenda. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm really excited to be here and really excited to see all your faces in the crowd there. I'm really happy so many of you are interested in the day-to-day -day life of a comic artist. Um, first off is my first slide on the presentation. <laughs> don't, excuse me, don't panic. You'll hit your deadline. <laughs> um, and your horse hat mask. Yeah. Yes. Um, Every time I start a comic issue and I'm given the script, it's fun, exciting, and I'm really happy. I, I love the stories I'm given, but there's always that bit of panic. You can't, I, I can't seem to get rid of no matter how many issues I do. It's like, oh, this is gonna be a lot of work. It's <laughs> so what I do is I um, break the process into steps to kind of gauge how long I can take to do this step or this step and this step and fit it into the time slot I have to get the issue done. And that helps calm the nerves a little bit and make it feel a lot more manageable. So that's why I start off by saying, don't panic, you'll hit your deadline. So we'll go on to the first step, which all begins with a script. So for me, I, I have not yet written a script for My Little Pony specifically. I know on my profile I, I wrote writer and artist but because I do my own self-published comics, but I was like, maybe that will be confusing for people who might think I do writing on the ponies, but I actually do not. I just do the, the art. So what happens is Bobby, the editor on the comics, will usually forward me a script and be like, are you interested in this issue? And I'm usually always interested in the one he gives me. It's, the writers are really good and their, their stories and their descriptions for the art and actions are very exciting and fun to do. So I always look forward to, to, what, to see what story, probably with as much anticipation as you guys do when you pick up the final product. Um, yeah, so the script, the way that they write it for me is they, the writer will break it down page by page, panel by panel, so I will get a script and it will say, uh, page one, panel one, and have the action and the dialogue. So I have a little sample up here of um, the holiday special that I got from Katie Cook last year. Was it last year? Yes, I, I think it was last year. It blurs. Yeah, it blurs in my memory. Um, so this is the kind of stuff she would send me, which is kind of fun, I think, for the fans to see you get a little bit of inside information of how the writer would have written the description that doesn't come out in the final. So it, look, it looks similar to a movie script. Yes, very similar. So page eight, panel one. Luna whining on the ground as Rainbow looks on. Rainbow has started to put, on, put some fallen baskets back into the cart and is ignoring the tantrum. 
<laughs> Luna, pin feathers. There's no way I can fly right now. A goose-related injury can take weeks to heal. How am I supposed to deliver all these baskets before morning if I can't fly? And then Rainbow says, a few of these baskets are a little bent, but the stuff inside is still good. So I like, I like when the writers will put the emphasis on the words, because it really helps the acting when I go to draw it on the page to really hear, like, oh, how can I fly? Like, she's really mad. So I really like when writers do that. And so that's a little sample of that. Um, and then we got five weeks go is the next part. Um, Usually, the timetable that I have once I get the script is about four to five weeks long. Usually five weeks, because I'm not as quick as some of the other artists, <laughs> I regret to say, but um, everybody works differently. So I break those, like I say, I break those four to five weeks down, and I try to generally keep a day for thumbnails, which I'll get into later. Um, thumbnails, the next stage would be penciling, and the next stage would be inking. So I usually try to take two weeks for pencils, two weeks for inks, and then that fifth week is just a nice, comfortable um, bleed over in case anything, like there's any hiccups along the way, I've got extra time in case I need it. So you do both the inks and the penciling. I know yeah. some comic companies uh, share that load with between more artists. Yeah. For you, it's all, all you. Yes, yeah. And if I had more time, I would like to do the coloring as well. I did color one issue, which was the issue with Spike and um, Twilight Sparkle. I remember. When they were, that when looked they were really kids. nice. Oh, thank you. I mean, I, I love Heather Breckel's coloring a lot, and it's not that, and it's not any offense to her, of course. I just, I'm a bit of a control freak sometimes, and I like <laughs> to control the aspects of the visuals. So, I mean, I do love Heather's stuff, and I'm always excited and happy when I see her colors come back, but yeah. All it's right. a good feeling to do it yourself, I get yes. it. It's both good. <laughs> Someone else interprets what you did, but you interpret it yourself. Yeah. It's also good. Yeah, so we'll get on to stage one, the thumbnails. Um, I don't know if this, this word thumbnail is... I got it from when I were, was in college. We called our little preliminary sketches thumbnails. And I guess it's a common enough term in the English-speaking world is to call them thumbnails, because I've come across other people who will use that term as well. But... Um, yeah, these are just the preliminary sketches. I just take a piece of computer paper, fold it in half, and doodle out the action as best I can. And if I don't like it, I can scratch it out and redo it. It's very unrefined <laughs> at this point, And sometimes it gets really messy, and I don't know if anybody else looking at it can understand any of it at all. But it's kind of just visual notes for how I might want the page to look. So expressions like you know, the basic Rainbow Dash here at the, the very first, where she's yelling at the other. It's a holiday special, so there are reindeer ponies <laughs> in this one. She's yelling at the other reindeer ponies. And um, yeah, the basic panel setup, how I'd like the flow to go on the page and how I'd like the panels to be read. So we have some of that. For a writer, that would be the first draft, basically. Where everything's yes. just really rough and, and a bit messy, and it's just, this thing happens, I want to get that mm -hmm. down. Yeah, not, not everything on this stage makes it either. Like, I might be like, oh, that doesn't work. What was I thinking? <laughs> and redo it when I get to the page and see how it'll look in the final pencils. So that's stage one. Stage two, of course, is pencils. So what I do for pencils, I'll take those original thumbnails and I'll have them as a reference to the side. And I like to draw my pencils small. I, I tend to like to work small, so I'll pencil them out on eight and a half by 11, just c computer paper, so I don't feel like I'm ruining good quality paper <laughs> if I make any mistakes. Um, yeah, and I've got the little template for the comic size printed out on them, so I know what dimensions to draw everything in. This is, the illustration here is just a blown up sample, but that would be the full page of what I would do in pencils. And I mark what page number, what issue and what page number. Um, and if there's any mistakes on it and I don't like the panel layering, I'll just like get a new page and draw the bottom half on the page sometimes on a completely different sheet of paper and just composite them in Photoshop when I'm done. Smart. Just, yeah, just it's very, like I say, it's, it's pencils, it's a bit more flexible, obviously, than inks, so I don't mind being a little bit messier with it in that, in that regard. And there's another sample of the 
page nine. It's got a blank part at the bottom because that was a collaboration page I did with Katie Cook because there was several artists on that one issue. So we shared a couple of pages, which was really fun. <laughs> Uh, the stage three is the blue line stage. So this is where I would take the pencils and composite them onto Photoshop. So anything, if a one page spans over multiple papers, I'll cut them out, resize them, and I'm really terrible at scale, so I'll oftentimes have to scale down my ponies so they make sense against each pony and in the background. So I make sure everything works. I make sure everybody is the proper size and the perspective doesn't look too wonky, that sort of thing, and everything fits on the page nice and neat. Um, and then I take those blue line pages and I put them on the comics template that IDW gave me to make sure that it fits into their size dimensions so nothing, no images get cut off, no dialogue gets cut off when the final version is completed. So the idea of making the lines blue is part of the process with how the comics made? Yes, because when I do the blue lines, I will put down the opacity to 15%. So they're just very, very light blue lines of the, of the pencil pages. And I have a little note here that <laughs> I lost my blue lines for the pages that I'm using as samples. So these are actually from the Rarity and Mod Friends Forever number 29 <laughs> issue. But this is the basic idea. Like, it's very, very light blue and I do it that way because when you use light blue or you print in light blue, um, when you rescan it again, that blue does not show up at all. Oh. It's completely gone. All you Lemon. get is the black and the white. So There's nothing left over from the sketches at all at that point. No, no. Mm. It's nice and clean and ready for the colorist. So I've learned that trick from my fellow comic friends. <laughs> They're like, because I, before I did that, I used to take the pencils and blow it up onto 11 by 17 the way I, I did, but I print it off and trace it on a light table and that took a lot longer and the images sometimes would get a little warped because it wasn't, I don't know, like the lines would be a little off from the original pencils and then the inks would make them even more off. So I just kind of found this, kind of kept the, the energy a little bit better instead of losing it in that extra tracing stage. So um, next stage is inking. <laughs> so, um, yeah, inking is self-explanatory, so I'll show you some of the samples. So this would be the final ink page. I like to work very clean with my inks, so that's... It shows. Yeah, so I know sometimes people have seen my originals in the past and they get like, is this a print-off? It looks like a print-off, and I'm like, no, it's, it's not. The, these, are, uh, these are the inks, I just like to work clean. So that's the sample of the holiday special page eight and the holiday special page nine, again with the blank space for Katie Cook's art. And I always like to sign and date my work. It's fun to, it's kind of fun to look back and see when exactly did I make that page and kind of like a journal in a way of my, my work. So it, it helps you keep track of your own progress and what yes. you've done at the time. It's, yes. It's nice. It's, yeah. I, I, I got into that habit as well. It helps. Yeah. And here are the tools that I use to ink, because I know a lot of people are very curious to know what an artist uses as they create their, their, uh, their art. So um, in the bottom, is it, yeah, it's right for you, the bottom right with the pencil. I use uh, the, the Stadler brand. I don't know if I pronounced that right. The Stadler brand, uh, 2H pencils. I like the harder lead, so you get a nice light line and you could kind of work it up as you're putting the final details on. Um, for the main characters, I use the Pentel pocket brush that's on the left bottom. I like the variation of line width that you can get with it, and it's really easy. Like, I also sometimes for other projects use a uh, sable hairbrush, uh, Raphael, but I find those ones are really hard to get around the really round curves of the ponies, whereas the Pentel does it really, really well and um, doesn't mess up my ovals and circles the same way. It just kind of... It's a really nice, reliable tool. I mean, it can get a little blobby when it's humi humid out, but if I keep a tissue around to dab it every so often, it's usually pretty good. Um, for the finer lines, I use, again, Stadler. I like that brand. <laughs> um, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, depending on what thickness I like. And for the really thin lines, I use a Unipoint uh, 0.05 or 0 0.01. 
Um, that was recommended again by a comic friend who said the tip of this is really tough and it can take a beating. So I'm like, <laughs> I like the sound of that. Let's do this. And I just got hooked on them for the finer details, uh, the thinner lines. So that's a summary of the tools I use. Oh, the paper, I just use um, a bristle paper. There's a printer that, that's a couple towns over from where I'm at, and he's a friend of ours, and he provides this really nice paper that really takes the ink really well. So unfortunately, I can't give you a brand because it's from a friend, but um, yeah, it's just a nice bristle paper, whichever your preference would be. All right, stage five is scanning. This is the not so creative part, but very necessary. So once your inks are all done and, and you're ready to go and you're like, this is good, time to send it to Bobby, you scan it in. Um, I have a, an 11 by 17 scan, scanner, which has saved my life. <laughs> I used to use just a normal size and I'd have to scan in chunks and composite them on Photoshop and it would be frustrating because you'd scan and it would be just a little bit skewed and then the bottom half would be just a little bit skewed the other way and then you'd have to rotate them and oh, it was, I didn't want to be making puzzles, so <laughs> putting puzzles together. So this 11 by 17 has been a blessing for sure. Um, yeah, we scan them, put them on Photoshop and we just kind of adjust, make it pure black and white. I knock out the white so it's just the line art and I send it to Heather and Bobby. You say there's sometimes you get ed edit requests from Hasbro? Yes. Can you give an example of what that looks like at that stage? Yeah, I do have uh, an example of that later on in the presentation. Okay. I will definitely get to it. Okay. Um, yeah, so yeah, we have some edits and luckily I'm with Hasbro, it's not that big of a deal. They don't give me too many edits, but every now and then. But like I say, I will get to that. And um, here we go. This is the part that's out of my control, is the coloring and the lettering. And this is really fun for me because it's just as much a mystery as it, you know, for you guys. So I'll see Heather. Heather's really fast at coloring. I'm always really <laughs> impressed with how quickly she starts to turn the pages out. And it's always so gorgeously done. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I, I'm oftentimes not even finished the inking stage and she'll start, be starting on the beginning of the issue already. So that's always really exciting. I, it kind of puts a fire under me too. I'm like, I'll get these inks done and make sure she can do her three pages a day and I won't let her down. <laughs> so yeah, it definitely puts a fire under me to see her pages starting to come in and see it all come together. And then um, Bobby will take it to the letterer and she'll put all the dialogue in and we just check for errors, like spelling errors or sometimes the balloons are pointing to the wrong characters. So we try to catch that before it goes to the printer. So it's always nice to have those files, the PDFs sent before it goes to the printer just so we can double check and make sure everything's in order and everybody's saying the proper dialogue. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's really, as you can see too, um, Katie Cook has her part on the bottom of the page now and I didn't actually see any of her art until this stage so I was really excited about that too because I'm a big fan of Katie's writing and her art style so it was really an honor that we shared a page. Um, here's another example of the process. Um, this is the art piece I did for the art book, the comic art book oh, that, that was put out by that, IDW. That, that one's really lovely. Yeah, I was really impressed with that book. It was gorgeous, and I was really honored they asked me to be a part of it. Um, yeah, they requested that we did um, a pinup exclusive for the book, and I was very happy to do that. And they wanted a lot of uh, record of the progress because they weren't set in stone how they were going to do things yet, but they did like the idea of putting some progress images. So I, very, I documented this one very, very closely, so that's why I chose it to show you. So the thumbnail sketch, this one's actually a bit more detailed than I usually do, and it's in pencil, which I usually do my thumbnails in pen. But um, yeah, the basic idea is a triptych with the three princesses and Twilight's still just new, so she's, and of course she's the main character, so she gets a little bit of a, a spotlight there. She's not in the triptych yet, but she's definitely part of the princess crew. <laughs> and I just like Art Nouveau, and I like the idea of the triptych, and it's just, I wanted to make something that was visually appealing, so that's why I chose that. Um, I wanted to be very careful, though, with the symmetry of this image, so that's why in the second part, in the middle image, I have a grid over the top of everything so I could kind of really figure out the symmetry and make sure 
both sides equaled as best I could match, because it's all freehand drawing, so nothing's exactly perfect, but as perfect as you can get by hand. And then a little bit of a cleaner version of the pencils there on the, on the very end. Oh, I don't know if that shows up too well up there. But it's a little blurry, and I apologize, <laughs> the image. Um, the next step, again, the blue line stage on the, in the beginning. And then again, I print it off the low opacity blue line, 15%, and then I do the inks over top. And this version here is the color flats. So I just put down the basic color palette for the image before I do any rendering, just to kind of get a feel of what I might, where I might like to take it with the rendering. And this is the final piece, once I get all the shadows and the highlights done. And this is what they published in the book for Very the nice. pinup. Thank you. <laughs> OK, here's the part about mistakes. <laughs> so yes, mistakes happen. And uh, we, I try to avoid them as best I can and try to keep the characters on model except, of course, when I go a little goofy with the expressions, and I'm always very grateful Hasbro lets those go, because sometimes, especially the Pinkie Pie issue I worked on with her in Twilight, I did some really weird things with the expressions, <laughs> and I'm like, this is gonna come back for sure. But generally, they left it alone, so it was so okay. Like, it's like, for instance, so silly expressions can be too silly. Yeah, I was wondering if I was pushing it way too off model, like if they would be like, no, bring that, bring that back a little bit. But no, they're, they're pretty good with that kind of stuff but every now and then they will come back with some random things. Like one time they asked, you know, Twilight, could you put the dip in her back a little bit deeper? Because I guess I was drawing her back too flat. So I went back over the whole issue and did that, and that was no big deal, because they pointed it out in the pencil stage. So I still had, it wasn't in inks yet, it wasn't set in stone, so it was really easy. Um, for a while there I was drawing the ponies with really pointy muzzles. And I didn't realize that I was making them so pointy until one day Hasbro's like, do you think you could round out the noses? They shouldn't have round, the, they shouldn't have pointy noses. And I was like, oh, I didn't even realize I was doing that. And the ponies ended up looking a lot better because they pointed it out. So I was really grateful. And I was like, now I'm kind of wishing they said it earlier because <laughs> now I'm looking at all these pointy noses going, what was I thinking? But <laughs> yeah, just little mistakes like that. Um, there was one big, edit that I had to do on a cover, and that's the example I have for you of like what the biggest fix would have been. So the Rarity and Cakes Friends Forever issue, I think it was issue 18 or 19 on Friends Forever. This was the original that I sent them, um, and I had sent it to Bobby a long time before I got the edit, but when it finally did come back randomly one day, the, he said Hasbro doesn't like the way the chest looks and the way that the nose and mouth looks. And they wanted her to, hair to be a little bit cleaner. They're like, Rarity wouldn't have loose strands of hair like that. She'd be <laughs> nice and tidy. I was trying to go for that shoujo look, so I was trying to make wispy hair, and that's, <laughs> that's kind of where that didn't really work with what they wanted. So it's like, okay, we can fix this. We can, we can do this. And there's a bit of a rush on it, too, because it came a little bit last minute, the edit, and Bobby's like, I'm really sorry. I hope it's not too much trouble, but it's like, we'll do this. We'll do this the way they want it, so let's, let's get to it. So what I did was I redrew, like I took on a separate piece of bristle, I took the original line art, and I redrew the chest, and I did the, the mouth digitally because that wasn't a big deal. I tried to do the chest digitally at first, but that Hasbro's like, no, we still don't like it. So I'm like, okay, I'm, I can't get by with digital on this. I have to redraw it with ink. So I went back and redid it. It was a little tricky to get Mr. Cakes proper in the, the edit because it looked like he was just riding on Rarity's back, but he was tiny. So I was like, <laughs> how do I make this not look awkward, but keep the composition? So that was, a, that was I think, one of the trickiest parts was just making it Mr. Cake not look really awkward. So um, eventually it worked. I'm like, I'll just use the flowers and kind of fake it. Like, hopefully nobody will really think about it too much. But Flowers work. Flowers yes, work. yeah. So that's what I tried. And I, so I gave him this. I put all the edits in red so Hasbro would know right off what was the fix and what was the original. And they were happy with this one, so I was glad. But that left a lot of recoloring. And 
I was kind of like, well, I, I rendered the first one so much, but I don't know if I have time to re-render it or if I could blend the new and the old ones. So I just did a recolor that's more cell shading style rather than the... I was a little sad to lose the rendering because I put a lot of time into it. Did it, look, it did look very pretty. It definitely yeah. gave you an anime look you were going for. Yeah, so I just went for cell shading because we were a little short on time. So that ended up being the final printed copy right there. So as you can see, it went from that to that with the edits. So yeah, that's, that's the biggest fix I've, I've had. I mean, all, mo most fixes I get will happen in the pencil stage where it's, I'm definitely a lot more flexible, but this was a finished piece of artwork that I had to go back into once it was all colored up to figure out how to make it work. Um, and Sorry that the dialogue kind of cut off there. It's a little bit of awkwardness in the transition of the file, but uh, yes, that's the presentation. And thank you so much for your interest in the process. And I, I know everybody has a different way of approaching comics and how they would take a script to the page. And this is just one of many. I'm sure as many artists as you talk to will have as many different stories. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Now, Brenda is ready for your questions, so feel free to queue to my left and to my right. Is there anything you think that at least, like I said, family friendly, no spoilers, no things that Brenda is otherwise not allowed to even like know or talk about? Like a lot of the fandom stuff she will not know, even if you like it a lot, because some of these things Hasbro outright doesn't allow people to look at, and other things she just probably doesn't have the time. So. Keep it to things that she'll know in some degree. Yeah. In a lot of ways too, like, cause I don't do the writing and I'm on the art, I don't have any story information anyway. So <laughs> I'm not in charge of that part. So, but if you have any questions about the artistic process, yeah. working at, the, the, the process of working at IDW for a company like IDW, things like that, feel free to ask. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question, it's probably like yeah. really typical, but... Um, <laughs> Do you have an artist who you say like, oh, that, that person inspires me like a lot. That person, like, oh. yeah, I look at their stuff and I'm like, yes. Yeah, so, so many. I love Avatar, The Last Airbender and Woo! Korra. So. You have excellent taste already. Yeah. And of course, in, in relation to that, also the new Voltron. Ooh. So like, it's I started watching Mirror. that, it looks good. Yeah, Studio Mirror is really amazing. Like what they can do with animation and stuff. I just am blown away all the time I watch it, so. Yeah, I really like them. Um, a lot of my friends too, like I'm really inspired by my friends and their enthusiasm and their style and just seeing them grow as well gets me excited because it's like I remember years ago when I'd see your first comic and to see where you've come from there is really getting me pumped because you're into this, I'm into this, we just love the comics medium and yeah, that and... So friendship is magic. Yes, friendship is magic. So, <laughs> and they've got a lot of good tips and stuff for things that I have questions on too. So I find having friends who also work in art is really helpful to keep you jazzed. Yeah, I can confirm that. Get people, if you want to draw, get people around you who draw too. Even if they're better or worse than you, quote, again, quote, unquote, everyone's different. Yeah. But don't be afraid to talk to artists. Artists like to talk about their stuff. Yeah, and of course, in my formative years, I did like anime a lot. I got my card capture Sakura key on me today. And, and of course, Sailor Moon. So a lot of that magical girl stuff was a big thing in my childhood. So that also helped form, form my, my art style at an early age. Nice. <laughs> So, you first, please. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, you mentioned that the uh, stage of lettering is a uh, stage for itself, that is uh, later edit. And uh, I was wondering, um, are there, could there arise any problems with the, um, the space that is left for the letters? So, you have to intervene with the stage earlier when you already uh, do the penciling? And, um, and do you draw the speech bubbles yourself? No, I don't get to draw the speech bubbles. Every now and then I'll sneak in a little bit of hand lettering with my own speech bubble. For dialogue, I really want the, ex the vocal expression to come through. Um, I've been doing that a little less these days. But I, yeah, sometimes if I'm drawing 
the, the pencils and I scan them in and I'm like, oh geez, I didn't realize how much dialogue was in this and the characters are taking up a lot of space. It's really easy to just use the lasso tool around the characters and shrink them down a little bit so I can make room for the dialogue. And sometimes, there was, a, there was one time I did get um, the PDF back and there was a speech balloon that completely covered rarity and Aww. I was like, oh no, she would not approve of this, we gotta fix this. So I had to take um, the page from the color stage and try to rearrange, kind of post everything to kind of to make that dialogue work. So eventually we got it and rarity got to be seen and she wasn't <laughs> angry at us, so. <laughs> All good. But so you're accounting for space, for speech yeah. bubbles as your own thing because you don't place the speech bubbles. Yeah, it can be a little tricky because it comes, the speech bubbles come so much later in the process and I don't have control over it. So it's a little tricky to kind of... So you just try to estimate. Yeah, to try to predict where they might show up. All right. So. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Your turn, please. So Hi. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned the writing comes in from the writers. Mm -hmm. Are they usually like comic artists themselves and know how things would usually fit on a page? And related to that, had you ever to give them something back? Like, no, this won't work if I put it on the page. Please <laughs> fix it. <laughs> um, usually the writers are, they just write. They don't have any... Uh, experience with the art and it's funny I think it was Heather Newfer who said to me she's like oh thank you for interpreting my visual my weird visual notes so well <laughs> so um, yeah sometimes there'll be a little bit you know a lot of information in one panel with a lot of panels on a page but the writers are always really good if I need to add an extra panel to add a little bit more to the page to make the flow make a little bit more sense and so, yeah, they're a bit more open to, like, they're not like, this is what I wrote, and you have to draw it exactly. They're never like this. They're very, <laughs> like, if there's anything that doesn't work, like, just let me know, and we, I'll adjust the script accordingly so the, the letterer will know where the dialogue's supposed to go. So, yeah, I'm really lucky that way. <laughs> so, Kate, so Katie Cook is an exception, actually. So she, she can draw and write. Oh, right, yes, yes. Actually, that's a good point. Sorry about that. That's right. I've only worked with Katie once, so I guess I don't think of her right away. When I think of the writers, even though obviously she's a main one and very important, I just, I guess, tend to think of the ones that I've worked with mm -hmm. the most. But yeah, Katie does her own writing and, and drawing sometimes, so. That's an exception. Then. Yeah, she's the one exception. Okay. Yeah, sorry, thank you so much for pointing. Uh, no I, I'm sorry, Katie, if you ever see this. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, yeah, cool, thank, thank you. you. So much. Hi, I'm Celestia Fan from Twitter. Um, a few days ago, I asked you about what's your favorite cover, and now I see your presentation about the holiday special. So, this one. Oh, yeah. So, I have a question. Um, do we have an autograph session later on? Um, I actually have a table. Um, it's upstairs. It's in the vendor area. Okay. And I'm there all weekend, so you'll definitely be able to find me to get signatures. But then I give you this now. Sorry? I oh. give you this now. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for the yeah, thank that's you. That's really sweet. Thank you. <laughs> Can you hold it up for the audience? Oh, Can yes. It it's a stitched bag. It's stitching on it. Very nice. Yes, and it's, it's Luna yet basically yelling <laughs> at the whole, from the holiday cover. Yeah, I just thought it was a funny idea if she was with the, oh, I, oh I'm terrible with names, <laughs> the, the group there, the singing group, and with her royal voice. <laughs> yeah. The pony tones, yes, thank you, the pony tones, and she's using that royal voice and just drowning them all out and being kind of unaware of what she's going on. Excellent. <laughs> I love that cover oh, a lot. Thank you very it's very much. in character. It feels like, yeah, I thank can you. see this happening. <laughs> okay, next step, please. Hi. Hi. Um, earlier you mentioned that Hasbro likes to watch a little bit over your shoulder when you're working. Um, so I was wondering um, how you can develop um, a personal style if you have to stick to some standard model. Yeah, I think if it's close enough, 
because one thing I do love about the My Little Pony comic series is every artist and every writer, they team up and they bring something completely new to the comics. So we've been very fortunate that um, Hasbro, as long as they're on model enough, they're happy if we can put a little bit of individuality into it. Like Andy Price works so much differently than Agnes, who works so much differently than Tony. And so I, I find that fun too, because it's like I work on the comics, but I can also still be a fan of the other people's work and their writing. And yeah, so yeah, we've been very fortunate with Hasbro for sure to let us kind of do our thing as well as kind of try, you know, try to keep to the pony model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Your turn. Hi. Hello, Ms. Brando. My name is Chef. I have a question about for new artists starting to get an illustration. Mm -hmm. Do you recommend jumping straight into like pony tutorials or learning general, general illustration techniques first, like perspective and whatnot? And then once you have kind of a sense of your own uh, workflow, then j jumping into specific things like ponies? Um, I think. For me, like when I was a kid growing up, was I just always drew and I only focused on character until I got to college. And I found once I started working on perspective and how to set up a scene, because um, I worked very, very briefly in an animation company doing backgrounds for an animated kids show called Raspberry Jazzberry Jam, which was a Canadian program. But it really taught me how to set up a scene and how to put characters into it and how to make them relate to one another. There was that that really taught me that. And um, also a book by Scott McCloud called Understanding Comics where he described backgrounds not as a backdrop but as an environment for characters to act with. And that really inspired me to work on the perspective and the backgrounds. And I think that was really what pushed me from just uh, novice drawer to a professional was really knowing how to set up a scene and how to use your visuals to tell the story using any kind of tricks and techniques you could like staging in a background you show kind of like similar pieces of the same background after after an establishing shot so I'd say something really good to work on would be I mean definitely your characters and posing that's not unimportant it's just you kind of have to know how to make it all work together and um, you can, when it comes to comics, comics are kind of free reign. You can do what you want with them. The thing I like about this day and age is that web comics kind of open the floor for whatever stories, whatever characters, whatever voice you want to give to them. You don't have to adhere to anybody's standards. So it's a good place to learn and explore and get feedback from people in your audience to tell you if they like your story and what things are working at, from a reader's perspective as well, because that's also very valid. Um, did I miss anything else uh, or? Uh, I think that's it, thank you. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> making thank sure you. I answered everything. So thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Just as a personal note, I strongly do recommend the, the books by Scott McCloud. He, yes. he wrote three in total about comics, it is basically the whole subject, both on a more philosophical standpoint, but also just practical. How do I tell a story in the medium of comic? The books are really, like, really famous, have been translated to a gazillion languages, so honestly, it's, it's worth looking up. Scott McCloud, the name is easy to remember. Yeah, it changed my world. <laughs> I have them, I, I need to read them again. They, every time I read them, I learn something new, I see something new where I'm like, this helps, so big, really recommend it. Huge, mm -hmm. huge good thing, really good thing. Your turn, please. Uh, first, thanks for being here. Um, Thank you for coming. <laughs> and the question I have is about how do you deal with, if you have a very specific idea in your head about how something should look and you just can't make it work, you just can't get it to work on paper. And I mean, on the one hand, uh, how do you deal with it artistically? On the other hand, um, psychologically, that it doesn't drag you down into self-doubt or maybe even an art block. Uh. Um, well, it's really hard to not get the self-doubt and the <laughs> self-hate, let me say. I don't know that this will ever go away because even artists that have been working in the industry many more years than I have, I talk to them about these problems and they say, oh yeah, I've got days I just lie on the floor saying, why? Why do I do this? <laughs> and if I've done this for this many years, how come it's still hard? Because it'll never be easy, unfortunately. Um, 
you'll just kind of develop better ways of coping, maybe, I hope. <laughs> so you deal with it, you learn to deal with it. Yeah, you learn to deal with it. Some days are harder than others, but you learn to deal with it, and you, you get through it. Um, yeah, and if, if something really isn't working and you're super stressed about it, sometimes the best thing to do is leave it for a while, and maybe even like scrap it completely and come at it from a different angle, because maybe, maybe you're just giving yourself too much work, because sometimes I'll be like, oh, this is so frustrating, I can't get this, and I realize I haven't done a close-up shot in a few panels. I'm like, you know, I could just give myself a break. Instead of drawing all this background in every panel, why don't I just give a nice close-up? People like close-ups, so why do, <laughs> why do I feel I have to draw a bazillion things in every panel? So, yeah, just try to remember to breathe and, and come at it at a different perspective when you're, you've calmed down a bit, because unfortunately, I can't guarantee that so self-doubt will ever go away. <laughs> I wish I could. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. Yeah, Thank you're you. welcome. Your turn, please. Hi. Hi there. Um, I just wanted to ask, are there any tips you would give someone who um, is just starting out or just considering um, drawing comics? Like, for example, is there a certain type of, like, pen you should use or certain types of shape you should practice drawing or something um, like this? It's kind of whatever you want. I think when you begin, especially the very, very beginning, just do what's fun for you because it's not a job yet. You don't have to stress about things. You just tell us, I want to just tell a story and I just want to do these drawings and I just want to do these drawings because at that point it's for you, you know? So make it yours, make it something you're excited to go to the drawing table and work on. Um, because you're not obligated to anybody at that point, and it's all personal growth. Um, as for the tools and stuff, it's whatever you want to use. Like, comics are whatever you want them to be. Uh, like, I've known people who use photography to t like, as their visuals, and then they'll write dialogue over the photos, and that's a, their comic. And I know this guy who lives in my hometown, and his goal is to use the, like, the cheapest material. He's like, Sharpie on copy paper. I don't, want any, like, I don't want it to be precious. I want it to be more emotion, like quick to the page. Like, that's his technique. So it's whatever you want to do and whatever medium you feel comfortable with. Like, I personally like the brushes and the, the felt tip pens, but that's not for everybody. So it's what you want to do. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Uh, honestly, like, I'm obviously not the pro here, but from my personal perspective, when you buy like really fancy materials, you really get really scared of using them wrong. You're like, but what is this picture sucks and I wasted this, I don't know, $10 copy marker. <laughs> yeah. So honestly, start our cheap, it's fine. It might not be like the fanciest, but honestly, like a good tool can make a decent drawing even nicer. But mm -hmm. if you don't know anything about your tools yet, don't, don't stress it. Go start simple, easy, cheap, doesn't matter, it's fine. Yeah, when Learn I was... The basics, and don't stress it. Yeah, when I was a kid growing up, when the back to school sales would come on, I was the happiest kid, not because I wanted to go back to school, because I hated <laughs> school, but because then suddenly you get those, um, the paper with the blue lines on it, though the packs of paper would be on sale and those mechanical pencils and my mom would buy me some and a, and a new binder so I could put all these pages in and make my comics. So yeah, that's how I started was just mechanical pencils and like school paper. <laughs> and it's a perfectly fine way to start. Yeah. Your turn, please. Okay, hello. Um, my question is, what is your favorite MLP character to draw? Or which is the most to fun? To draw, I like drawing Rarity a lot. Like she is one of my favorites. Fluttershy is my favorite pony, but I think because I want to make her look as good as I can. When you're too focused, I want to make this the best drawing. It, it's never your best drawing. So <laughs> unfortunately for Fluttershy, I think I put too much care that it kind of backfires. Uh, but Rarity is a lot of fun. It took a while to understand the hair curls in her mane. The hair is crazy. Yeah, it took a while to understand that. But once I figured it out, I was like. I like this, and her eyes. I find the, the ones that have the big oval eyes are really hard to ink sometimes, so the fact that hers are the nice curved line at the top, at the bottom, I don't have to stress so much about 
what if I get that oval wrong? <laughs> Thanks. So yeah, Rarity is definitely a lot of fun to draw, and she's so dramatic. Oh, yeah, it's just, oh, oh it's like, amazing. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank yeah. Thank you. Your turn, please. Hi. Uh, hi. Um, you mentioned that you are not currently writing any comics for or pony comics. Um, if you are given free hand to write whatever pony story you would want to, what would it be? Um, I had this idea one time, and I just kind of chickened out because. Uh, and again, with the whole self-confidence thing. <laughs> Stor I'm more comfortable with art than storytelling at this point. But yeah, I had an idea where it was like Trixie's backstory or something, where she flunked out of the university, for the Cel Celestia's university, and she kind of, without letting anybody know, she kind of took off before graduation ceremony because she didn't want to admit defeat. And then she met the Flim Flam brothers who taught her how to scam. Oh, so. <laughs> they're good teachers. <laughs> yeah. So I thought that would be a kind of funny story, and they helped her set up the whole Ursa Minor scenario, where they they kind of put the trick on, and she kind of came out to the town to to destroy it. And, but it was the Flim Flam Brothers, kind of, because they were on the run from the police in the town because they had scammed somebody, and they're like, we need to get out of here. So the, the Ursa Ma Minor would be there, covered to get out of town. <laughs> so. Yeah, that was that was one idea I had, but I just fell by the wayside a little bit. I didn't really do much or pitch it at all. So. I like I like the idea though. Yeah. yeah, I still think it's kind of fun. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. It seems like you have the honor of the last question. Thank you. <laughs> Comics as a medium is a really cool the storytelling uh, way, uh, but it's very often overshadowed by TV series and movies and other mediums. How would your, what's your thought about spreading more people to read comics? Um, I think if the comic shops were, like I know a lot of really, really good comic shops that are very open and welcoming to new clientele, but there's still some of those old ones where it feels a little bit like, you know, the guys are just in the back playing magic cards and anybody new coming in, it's like, so, uh, you know, they come in and they get ignored and the guys playing cards kind of look them up and down, like, what are you doing here? This isn't where you belong. So if that kind of starts to die out and, like, I know a lot of good comic shops though too. I'm not saying they're all the, the little dungeon comic shops, but um, yeah, really good ones. Like there's this one near my hometown, um, the next province over, uh, in Halifax called Strange Adventures, and he, uh, Cal, who runs that, he's always a really good person to say what he's doing to get to kind of expand the comics clientele. He has ladies' nights to invite women to come in ex specifically so they don't feel intimidated by the thought of, oh, comic shops, there's going to be creepy guys there. He has ladies' nights, and he'll, he'll invite actually uh, women who work in the comics industry to do oh. signings on ladies' nights to That's show... Awesome that, you know, this is for us too, and he... I like that a lot. Yeah, and at Halloween, instead of passing out candies, he'll pass out, like, some of the comics from his cheap bin. He says, rot your mind, not your teeth. It's his little slogan for that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, things like that, and if we could get comics out of just the comic stores, I think, like, in the way it is in North America, we don't really sell comics beyond... Um, the comic stores, except maybe a bigger bookstore will have the graphic novel collected versions, but you'd never get the single issues, except maybe some Archies on a spinner rack at Chapters kind of thing, or an Archie comic at the grocery store, but we don't really have more than Archie at the grocery store, so there's a lot more all ages. I think, from my understanding, I think in Europe, there's more... It's a bit different. Yeah, it's a bit more... All ages is a bit more accessible. In general, the, the, art, the medium of comics, I feel, is, 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 has had an easier time in Europe being seen as actual art than yes. in, in, in America. In America, I think it had a harder time being taken seriously. Yes, that's, I feel that's true, too. So, yeah. I'm, I'm glad to hear that there's you know, more efforts to make it more open, because I think nerdy things are for everybody. Yes. Right? So it's like, we're all here. We're all, we're all fine here. It's fine yeah. that we're here. Yeah. And nobody should feel like they shouldn't be here. So. Yeah, like IDW did a 
they did the small versions of the comic books. Um, they called them fun packs, and they reduced the size, put them in a little pack with little temp tattoos and stickers, and Aww. you can find those at Toys R Us and at Target and stuff. And Shoppers Drug Mart, where I'm from, the can Canadian store. So yeah, they're, they're trying to kind of push them into, into the, the realm of every day, so. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. I guess that all that leaves me to say is thank you very much, Brenda, for being here, for doing this wonderful panel. Yeah, I learned My stuff. pleasure. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming to check it out. And a big applause for Brenda, please. And for you guys, too.